also to welcome all of you for this evening of celebration of the world, of free the world. Pen International is the international writers organization. We have more than 30,000 members. We are active in more than 100 uh, countries. You know us because we are constantly campaigning for writers in prison in countries like Turkey, Iran, China, and well, we are uh, this Freedom of Expression organization, but we are also celebrating literature, and I am very happy that we are having here uh, with us the winner of the New Voices Award, the, the writer who won our award for young uh, unpublished uh, writers, to which writers from all around the world uh, can be candidates. And we have here Masande Sangha, who won the award three years back. And it's, it's been a pleasure uh, to know that uh, after the award, of course, he was, his book was published, and a second uh, novel he has published has already sold the rights for a movie. So we are uh, thrilled of having been in the very initial stages of his uh, literary uh, career. So welcome, uh, Masan and Sangha. And let me tell you, all of you, uh, friends from uh, Johannesburg, who are here uh, tonight with us, that we have been gathering in your city since Monday in a pan-African meeting. We have here delegates from the centers from 17 uh, African countries. We have been working very well together and we have defined a uh, pan-African network which will be promoting campaigns, actions at several levels uh, from uh, now uh, onwards. But also we are starting today this uh, meeting of the delegates of the African centers with delegates who have come from our federations in other places of the world. We have delegates from uh, Kazakhstan, from Quebec, from the United States, from Wales, from Switzerland. We have Basque and Catalan uh, delegates from Norway, from Hungary, who have come to know about the struggle of the African centers in the promotion of African literatures. PEN International is committed. Many of our centers in Africa and in other parts of the world are promoting mother tongue education through programs of uh, creative writing, through programs of uh, presence of writers in the school in link with the African uh, languages. And we are promoting uh, African literatures in translation, uh, in their presence at the international level, in uh, the spirit of equality between all literatures in the in the world. Uh, as you can see, today I've been decorated uh, because it's really a day of celebration. So we have been able today to share the enormous challenges that we face uh, in the, at the level of freedom of expression, at the level of translation and promotion of the African literatures, but in a spirit of celebration of the world, of celebration of their creativity that we feel that in all our communities, all around Africa and in other parts of the world, literature has the power to say the reality that we're living, to give words, to give meaning to the hardest, to the cruelest realities, to give meaning to struggles for justice, for recognition, for respect. And this is why tonight, in this spirit of celebration, we have organized this, uh, uh, how much this dialogue, to Keorabetse uh, Hosinsile, the South African National uh, Poet Laureate. Uh, we admire his poetry, have been uh, very happy of having been able to read his poignant uh, verses and uh, to know about his life of, uh, of his life in exile, his life of, of several struggles, but also his uh, person as a champion of justice and the defense of the rights of the people. And in dialogue with dear uh, Kerabaitse Jose Sile, we have Simona Skravich. Simona Skravich is really a, a bridge person, a person who has converted his life as translator. She is the translator of between two minor languages, literatures in, in Europe, 
Slovenian literature and Catalan literature, and he has translated several thousands of books from uh, Slovenian into Catalan, from Catalan into Slovenian, and he has created a link between these two old uh, European uh, nations for several years. He is also a reputed intellectual, he has written several essay books, he has won important uh, awards for her reflection, and it's a pleasure to uh, uh, give to her the floor to start the conversation with Kero Paes Institute. But before, before, we are going to have a moment of presence. Of the empty chair. This is a liturgy that we are having in all our pen meetings. So we make present those who are absent. Those who are absent because they are in prison. And uh, tonight, the empty chair is for Nenghi Ilaha. Nenghi Ilaha is a Nigerian poet, journalist, cultural critic, and author. He is my age, born in Nembe, in the Bayelsa state. He was English and Literature uh, Studies uh, teacher at the University of Port Harcourt and editor of The Tide on Sunday. Matt Dietz, his first collection of poems, won the award of the Nigerian Authors Association. His poems have appeared in many Nigerian international newspapers, journals, and anthologies. On 14 December 2015, he was served a court summons for contempt of court. He attended the summons and was taken from the police station directly to prison, reportedly without being allowed to speak to his lawyer or his wife. Ilaha has been held at Okata prison in Yenegua since the day he was arrested, but has yet not been tried. Ilaha had previously lost a libel case in 2013, in which he had no legal representation. Brought by the Amayanabu, the traditional ruler of the Membe Kingdom, King Edmund Dakuru, for a book he wrote called Episodes to the Magua Bebe, which was seen as critical of Dakuru. The court ordered 30 million in damages and 80,000 in costs against Ilaha, along with an apology on the front pages of three national daily newspapers. According to news reports, Ilaha was unaware of the proceedings which led him to be in contact of court, and we believe that this is the reason why he is still in prison without having been tried. So tonight, his present with us in this celebration of the world through his absence. Simone. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to introduce you uh, to uh, Keora Petze. And we, were, we agreed that we will just start jumping in to his poetry. But before he starts reading, let me explain a small anecdote. Yesterday, we had a, a dinner together, and then all Romana and Diana and Liana from a, a London office, they confessed, they wrote uh, a, a poem by Kero Apetze, and that, that poem moved them so much that they really almost start crying. So we will start with his poem, Anguish, Langa, Than Sorrows, and I am convinced you will really feel why they feel so moved. Good evening again, everybody. Uh, anguish, Langa, Than Sorrow. If destroying all the maps known, would erase all the boundaries from the face of this earth, I would say let us make a bonfire to reclaim, to sing, to reclaim and sing 
the human person. Refugee is an ominous load even for a child to carry. For some children, words like home could not carry any possible meaning. But this place, border, refugee, must carry dimensions of brutality and terror past the most hideous nightmare anyone could experience or imagine. Empty their young eyes, deprived of a vision of any future they should have been entitled to since they did not choose to be born where and when they were. Empty their young babies, extended and rounded by malnutrition and growling like the well-fed dogs of some with pretensions to concerns about human rights violations. Can you see them now stumble from nowhere to nowhere between nothing and nothing? Consider the premature daily death of their young dreams. What staggering memories frighten and abort the hope that should have been an indelible inscription in their young eyes. Perhaps I should just borrow the rememberer's voice again while I can and say to have a home is not a thing. dreams. Amongst the silences of restless nights, my voice wants to break through the shell of words to name and sing the evidence of our resolve and will to live past the glib claims of noble intentions. <laughs> If you have never walked through the restless shadows of wounded dreams, beware, the young ones of tomorrow might curse you by not wanting to remember anything about your ways because everything about you leaves a bitter taste in the mouth. Amongst the silences of this restless night, our dreams refuse the perfumed bandages that try to hide the depth of the wounds of their wounds. Our voice yearns for the precision to name what we are most responsive to, the way our lady of the Martin Vindaloo of my desire said. Listen here, Shanti. This is Hell's Kitchen. You will walk out of here tall. You hear? Though the present remains a dangerous place to live, cynicism would be a reckless luxury. A pile of toxic lies deodorized to sound like the most clear signage so showing us the way forward from here. Not that I am dotard enough to think it could ever be easy or without pain to do anything of value. But when I'm surrounded by the din of publicly proclaimed multiple promises, I wonder if we can say with determined resolve like Fidel, never again will pain return to the hearts of mothers, 
nor shame to the souls of all of our next South Africans. Though the present is a dangerous place to live, possibility remains what moves us. We are all involved. Indifference would simply be evidence of the will to die or trying to straddle some fence that no one has ever seen. Together we can and must rehabilitate our wounded dreams to reclaim and nourish the song of the quality of our vibrant being as evidence of how it is to be alive past any need for a single lie. Out of the silences of this restless night, my voice wants to break through the shell of words and fly to the rooftops to shout when we have walked through the restless shadows of winter dreams and come back from tomorrow Yet we shall know each other by the root of our appetite. Thank you. The last one I'll read is very short. It's called a Tepui, which is what a bad town or same thing. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, or near the five Indian Ocean, uh, was called by the inhabitants before the advent or arrival of the settler, in this case, English, and became German. It's for Edessa and all the poets and celebrants Poetry Africa in 2002. I plunged into that boy, oh, Edessa, when he was a young Filipina poet. No longer that young now. I plunged into language, hoping to emerge with the shout or whisper of the quiet and secret places my sister celebrates the tender and brief name of her voice moving us deep into all that we are or could be. Here we must jump to recreate ourselves where Keith Jarrett wants us there's no way to practice jumping except by jumping. Like any child you know, I grow. When they ask me then, since I've been to this big water's how does it feel and what I'm growing, well, I know what to say. Here, amongst the sounds of the ocean, the river that moves like the dancer, and the hills whose back you must ride anywhere you want to go. I've met the whole world in motion like the ocean. <laughs> So much, we uh, yesterday. I uh, I'm feeling now like this last poem of yours, saying there is no other way to practice jumping but, but by jumping. I have to present you a very important uh, South African poet, and the all sorts of information I have are of course internet pages. So I know I will commit a lot of. Uh, mistakes or uh, imprecisions, but I will still uh, jump into this ocean and try to present him in the best way I can. But I know already that his date of birth 
is wrong on all the official information. Because he was born 19 September, uh, and I was uh, very, uh, very glad to, to read that because my anniversary is 15 September. So I thought, oh, wonderful, look, we are like, and no, he's born 18 February. And also, they all say he's born in uh, Johannesburg, and that is also not true because they, uh, his parents try to protect him if there is any change of law and so on, that he would be considered born in the big city. Uh, but he will explain us all that later. Let me just introduce him a little bit uh, with, uh, some, with some details for all our, uh, especially for all our members from uh, all over the world, because of course we don't know him so well. Kero Apetze Kogotzile, uh, is a poet and political activist, as you can already imagine from his poems we already heard. And he was an influ influential member of African National Congress in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he lived in exile in the United States from 1962 to, 90, uh, to the 90s. And at the peak of his literary career, he was actually living in the States. Uh, he was interested in the study of African American literature and particularly in jazz. So I, I suppose you are pleased to be today re making this reading in the jazz club. Uh, and in the 70s, uh, he was really the central figure, figure among African American poets and well known by his readings in the New York jazz clubs. Uh, and he was also, he is considered the first bridge uh, that uh, uh, was able to um, superate the, the gap between African poetry and black poetry in the States. As I said, all the internet pages and other official documents say he was born in Johannesburg, which is actually not true. Uh, and his experience of uh, apartheid, as he said, is uh, when he was adult, he actually experienced this, uh, uh, this separation. Uh, his first literature, uh, contact with literature, they say, uh, was uh, through the politically uh, charged newspaper, New Age, where he started to uh, write his early poems. But in uh, 1980-61, this newspaper was shut down and uh, he was urged by the African National Congress to leave the country. So after a brief period in Tanzania, he arrived 62 to the United States, uh, studies, worked there, and uh, he actually finished the Master of Fine Arts of Columbia University. And his first collection of poems was uh, published then, Spirit Unchained. And in 71, we have here his first, uh, and, uh, his most influential and well-known book, My Name is Africa. Uh, he was always working, uh, believing that we people all have the creative power to change the reality. And he actually was considered as somebody uh, who was unafraid to be militant uh, for the cause. His return to Africa very briefly uh, is in 70, uh, 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 five, uh, 75, he returns to Tanzania to the University of Dar es Salaam, uh, and then in the 90s, in, 90, uh, in the June of 91, he turn, uh, returned to South Africa, and in that year is also his first book published in his native country with a title "When the Clouds Clear." And yesterday we talked about uh, his essay "Crossing Borders Without Leaving." Uh, which I believe is also a very important reflection about how is when you return home. Because we, a lot of us, we have some kind of experience of exile, but I believe that there is another, m maybe even more difficult uh, experience, which is to return to your home country. This is very briefly. You will be now able to uh, correct all my mistakes, which are not my mistakes, but they are mistakes of the uh, internet pages. Uh, so I would like to ask you if you can 
really briefly explain us your story. What do you remember of your historical background as a writer, as a fighter for the freedom of expression? Which are these turning points that you really consider the most important in your life? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 but maybe I should start off by straightening out a few things from the internet. Yes, of course, I'm sure. <laughs> One of them being, uh, for instance, the nightclubs in the United States, and they are not cultural places. <laughs> no. They are the marketplace. They are strictly commercial. And they would not have tolerated any clown reading their poetry. That I could even go further and say, for instance, at some point in the 60s and 70s, uh, because when Ornett Coleman played, uh, people in the club would stop ordering drinks. So he was bad for business. And they decided they would not give him any gifts. So a whole lot of other jazz musicians decided to boycott those clubs. And they played in Europe, especially in Sweden, because they respect jazz. They played in North Africa, in Japan, and so on. But in the United States, they would play in public parks, in the black communities, like in New York, in Harlem, and Brooklyn, and so on, and play for the people without charging a single penny. Okay. So I hope that takes care of it. I did not live in any nightclubs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was but, curious about Yeah, but also where they are wrong is that my interest in jazz did not start in the United States. South Africa has a very vibrant jazz idiom of its own. In fact, when you talk about South African jazz, I suppose if it was in dealing like with language, you would say you're talking about jazz with a distinctly South African accent. But also in the township, like not far from here, the old Sophia town now is another mess. But in the original Sophia that uh, you could be in trouble if you didn't know the latest release from Blue Road. Yeah. So that, I mean, thugs could stop you in the street and ask you to whistle or act limb the latest Art Blakey, Sunny Rollins, you know, or, and if you didn't, you could be in trouble. <laughs> Serious. So in that sense too, I was saying earlier uh, to a friend here in a little that I could say just was saved my life. Perhaps literally. Right? Yeah, and that's what people ask about <laughs> the relevance of the arts to life. Careful. <laughs> uh, then the business about the, the 19th September is well, there was this teacher who was a relative, actually, a cousin of my father. 
who was in my assessment a bit of a bully and I never really liked bullies. I still don't. Uh, so when we were little kids in elementary or primary school, he would jump at anyone at random and demand you to say what your date of birth was. So I very consciously decided to discipline him. I was going to choose one and stick to him. <laughs> and I get parties over and until he gave up. But the joke was on me because years later when I was an adult and an actor, I forget my own thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. These were more anecdotes, but maybe we should start also speaking about your not so pleasant, not so easy a history of your life because I believe your life was quite difficult, no? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the South Africa pre-94 was not exactly a picnic for anyone with any social consciousness or sense of social responsibility. So, uh, it would be a bit difficult to talk about me in that context because we're talking about, yeah, we're talking about millions of people. But uh, New Age, the newspaper I went for was owned, it was a week, owned by the Communist Party and in Johannesburg, uh, or the Johannesburg editor was Rufus, who they killed uh, in Mozambique in a very barbaric manner. I mean, they followed the, the apartheid regime, followed the, to Maputo. Uh, uh, in uh, the Eastern Cape, it was the late old man, Wovan Becky, Tabo Becky's father. Uh, in the Western Cape, in Cape Town, Brian Banting. Uh, in, uh, in Devon, MP Nika. And if you know anything about those people in relationship to struggle, uh, you also know that uh, they were practically, how would I say? a constant form in the flesh of the apartheid regime. Uh, and that uh, they spent, for those who did not leave, around the time that I was instructed to leave, uh, spent quite a number of years on Robben Island, including old man Robin Becky. Uh, and uh, in following their footsteps, I suppose the path my life would follow was could have been easily for two. Uh, and in terms 
contre literary influences, although there are, there are many, many, but initially, I would give credit to uh, Stoana Wright, Wright Poet, who published in Stoana, when I grew up, uh, the, in fact, last night I was trying to explain when Guki and Shoinka and people like that started arguing that African literatures should be in African languages. My argument, like with I suppose a number of other South Africans, was that that argument would not apply here because our literatures in where in indigenous languages, where language, that uh, those of us writing in English then, talking about Alex Kabuma, um, Pachele, Dennis Brutus, and then I argued once, even at an Afro-Asian writers' meeting, that we were perhaps a, not only a minority, but perhaps an insignificant enemy, relevant one in the broader kinds of things. Right? Although now it's no longer the same. It seems like, especially in the 80s, early 90s, that the younger aspirant writers seemed to believe that uh, to be a writer of relevance or significance, you had to write in English, in your colonial language. You know. uh, and then, after coming back, for instance, in traveling around the country, meeting younger writers, trying to convince them it would preferable and they would make more significant contributions to the development of literature if they wrote in whatever language they were most competent and comfortable in. They would get suspicious. This guy writes, writes in English and he tells us nothing. Maybe he's afraid of competition. Or <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I would use that, that uh, <laughs> observation for my next que question to you, uh, which is, I believe, uh, interesting all of us here, uh, is what is actually uh, your point of view? Where is today the African literature, especially West African literature, what kind of perspectives you see, what kind of challenges uh, must face, and also we are we were discussing the whole day today. So I'm asking you also uh, if you see any future, what kind of future for the literature written in non uh, in non uh, colonial languages, not uh, European languages, let's say like this. Okay. I think I'm glad to say uh, now. Uh, more and more younger people are interested in participating in literature through their own language, their mother tongue, uh, which is a good development. Uh, also, I think, though, I could say in whatever language, there is still a lot of garbage that passes for literature. Which He's a boy and says the truth. <laughs> uh, but, uh, 
what is good does exist, what is competently executed. Actually, what is very interesting is that uh, in my generation, when, when I was young, right? Uh, in, let's say if I give an example from another former English colony. I'm afraid to say British because, you know, when they say Britain, they include Scotland and Ireland in order to share their colonial barbarism. <laughs> and I think it's unfair. I think we should say English, be precise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the former English colony, that in Nigeria, where there was literature was vibrant, uh, poetry was in the forefront and then there were novelists and so on. In South Africa, it was the fiction writers in the forefront, mainly short story writers because uh, the dangers even of deciding to write. I give you an example like when Alex Laguna wrote his first novel because he was dead and under house arrest. There were typewriters then, by the way, not computers. He had to type one page, at the end of that, go and find a place to hide it in case the security police pounced on him. Imagine what that, what that does to continuity and the flow of your narrative. I write. Yeah. Okay. So writing was not like a picnic. Uh, and then, for instance, I say he also went for New Age, but then came down and said, I was in the newspaper. That if you went by a newspaper like New Age, you could not even get official press accreditation because that would have been like going to the apartheid authorities to say, lock me up. <laughs> Those were the realities we had to deal with. Uh, my earliest influences, as I say, was Sitwana literature. But at some point, this was in high school, I ran across a copy of Richard Rice's Black Boy, an African American sailor on a ship passing through Cape Town, had given that copy to someone in Cape Town. That single pop traveled around the whole country. Those of us who were interested in literature read that copy. You would keep it for a week or two, read and reread it, and pass it on. And for me, what it did was illustrated in very clear terms in how Richard Wright handled the English language that I did not have to sound like a carbon copy English poet 
that I could tame English enough to speak my language. Thank you. Uh, also, this last answer of yours uh, is giving me very good starting point to another, maybe a little bit more uh, in-depth question, uh, which would be why poetry, uh, how can poetry transform the society? And here we propose you something you agree that we can do, which is try to get to build a bridge between yourself and myself, between your references and poets and your poetry and the poets I wrote, uh, I read, I translated. Uh, and I am very interested in commenting something about your experience of exile, of living abroad, of uh, seeing that you can speak your own English, as you said, just uh, now, so if you uh, if you uh, permit me, uh, I would uh, reread the last uh, lines of your poem "Anguish uh, Longer Than Sorrow." Everybody here in the room remembers. I should just borrow the remembers voice again, while I can and say, to have a home is not a favor. And as a dialogue with that, I would propose a poem by the Bosnian uh, poet uh, Goran Simic, who lived actually inside the city during the siege in the 90s. And then he found his new home in Canada, where he was very well received. And here is a poem, I won't read it, the whole poem, but yes, some lines, some verses which I like very much because I recognize, I identify with that. And you will all laugh when I read the title of the poem, which is, I love my accent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Goran Simic is saying, I love my accent. I love that wild sea which attacked my weak tongue. And then explains the story about the. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, his grandfather who had an aquarius inside the house and how he learned by heart all the names of the fishes that were inside his house. And the poem then ends like this. 